Hello, welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. My guest today, Pat Stacy, has co-authored a book about her working, her romance, her life, and his death of John Wayne. The book is called Duke. My guest, Pat Stacy, will be back in 30 seconds, and we'll be talking about the last years of John Wayne, Duke's life. back. We're talking with Pat Stacy, author of An Intimate Memoir of John Wayne's Last Years, Duke, A Love Story, and it's published by Athenium. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It is a very intimate story, and it's a story that a lot of people might have wondered how you could have almost opened your heart again, both to tell the story and to let people know that you had been in love with him and the relationship. How did, how did you bring yourself to sort of sit down and open up your heart and your memories? I decided, Connie, that uh, I'd always said that I would never write a book. But as time went on, it seemed that I saw everywhere dolls of John Wayne, whiskey decanters, bronzes, some of them good, some of them bad. I mean, he had become some type of mega monument. It was all the, almost as though you expected to see his face up on Mount Rushmore. And Duke had once said to me, why doesn't anybody ever write a story and mention the fact that I kiss my little girl good morning when I wake her up to go to school? So I, I decided the legend, what we saw on TV, uh, uh, in the movies, was John Wayne. But behind that legend was also a man and a human being. Pat, you originally go to work for him as a secretary. Right. And you stayed a secretary all those years. <laughs> right. Did you get a raise? Well, I got a couple of raises, but uh, still, when, when Duke died, I was on his production company's payroll. Uh, I was making, I think, $225 a week. Uh, I got a lot of fringe benefits, but as far as that paycheck, it was $225 a week. Now, how did you make that, how did the switch happen? You talk about it in the book, about the night, the opening in, where was it, Seattle? Seattle. Right. And his sort of taking you to his bedroom. Right. We had been to the opening of Cahill, uh, U.S. Marshal, and Duke was working on a picture of McHugh in Seattle. And we had become very friendly, very close, I guess because uh, one of the things is we were working on uh, toward the same goals and so on. So we came home from, from uh, the premiere that night, and I guess the... Uh, I started to go to my stateroom. Chick Iverson and John Derrick were aboard. They had been with us. They went to their stateroom, and Duke put his arm around me and led me up to his stateroom, which seemed like the most natural thing in the world to do. I, I went with him. The next morning was when I thought, oh. What did I do? <laughs> and I, I thought, I hope nobody sees me as I'm coming, coming out. Well. On the Wild Goose in Duke's stateroom, there was a, a huge bathroom. I mean, all the women loved it because it had a big bathtub. Uh, so I come out wrapped in this big, huge towel, and who did I run into but Chick and, and John Derrick? And I thought, oh, they know. They didn't know anything. They, they thought at the time uh, that I had just gone up and used that wonderful bathtub. When this started, Pat, did John Wayne love you or you were just a convenience at that moment? Well, we had a great admiration and affection for each other. I don't think we really said to each other, I love you, until we were in London in 1974 working on uh, a picture called Brannigan. How many years in between was that? Two years. Now, at the time that you meet him, he is still married to Pilar. Right. 
was the marriage happy, unhappy, or were you sort of the cause that broke it up? I was not the cause that broke it up, and they, Duke and Pilar, had had problems since 19, oh, well, in the 1950s. And in the last interview that Duke ever gave with Robert Walters, he mentioned that I was the woman in his life, and when she asked him about, well, wasn't it a great change at his age to be separated, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he said, well, it probably wouldn't have happened except that they had just totally lost contact just totally lost contact with each other. How did she react to you? I'm asking these because in the book you do talk about how you become so close with the children that they are still your friends today. Right. But people hearing this will be wondering, was she a homebreaker? What was her role? Was she just some sort of baggage who came along and broke up what was a happy marriage? Mm -hmm. I understand that question. It's uh, uh, Pilar and Duke actually separated in uh, October of 1973. There had only been two occasions that Duke and I had shown any real affection for each other, both times in Seattle. And uh, then everything was back on a professional business basis. And I was very surprised, as a matter of fact, when, when Duke told me that uh, he and Pilar had, had dis decided to, uh, to split up. It had been rumored, but uh, Pat, I was besides surprised. besides your being there in Seattle, were there other so-called Pats in other places in his life at that point? No. No. Duke was a, really a, a one-woman man. Mm-hmm. And he went, uh, uh, after he and Pilar had separated and he started taking me places, he also took uh, a couple of other ladies uh, to some charity events and so on, but just for just a couple of times because for some reason that seemed all right to me if he took them out, but I was worried about what everybody was going to think if mm -hmm. I went out uh, socially with Duke. Yeah. I mean, I, I was concerned what my family was going to think. Um, what did they think? I mean, because you're a nice girl from Louisiana, you're a graduate of college, you're okay, you had one marriage that didn't work, but it didn't sound as if your family was used to their daughter being, well, living with a movie star. You know, they never talked about it, and they loved Duke. He, they came out to visit and would go to his house for dinner, and and uh, he would entertain them, taking them on cruises on Newport Bay. And it just, uh, if it ever bothered them, um, they never mentioned it. And when I wrote Duke a love story, I thought, you know, now what, they'll know. What is? I mean, they knew all along, or they had to know, but mm -hmm. they just never talked about it. And I thought, now what are they going to think when they? when I mentioned the scene that I leave his, his stateroom with a towel around me, you know. Uh, my mother said the only thing that bothered her about the book was that I mentioned that as, a, as soon as I got old enough, I was sent out into the fields to work. And I said, well, that was true. I was. And she didn't like that room She didn't up. like that. That's the only thing that bothered her. There are some very charming things in this book, such as John Wayne being a man which one never expected being touchy-feely that he was affectionate and was a hugger. Very affectionate, even with his older sons, uh, Michael and, and Patrick, who were great big fellows. He always had a hug for them when they came in the door, and they for him. The same thing with the, the younger children, and if Duke and I would be sitting at this table mm -hmm. where we worked all the time, uh, children would come in from school, they immediately dashed over, gave their dad a kiss, and, and he, they, it was just, uh, well, once Marisa told that sh she was Duke's youngest daughter, I don't think Miss Stacy likes me. And he said, why? And she said, because she never, she never hugs me. So Duke said, we're going to have to do something about that. Mm-hmm. Pat, you come into his life in what I would call the ebbing years, sort of the lion at sunset. Did you ever discuss marriage? We talked about it, and Duke said if he had been a young man of 50 or so, that uh, he would think about getting married again. But he had already been married three times. It didn't work. And at the time, there were 21 grandchildren. And uh, he just felt that he was too old to, to think about getting married again. Pat, we're going to break for one minute. Okay. And when we come back, let's also talk about you and your role in his dying because you held the hand. You were there at 7 in the morning and 6 at night and 4 at night. And we will be back with our guest, Pat Stacy, co-author of Duke, 
a love story published by Athenium. Welcome back. We're talking with Pat Stacy, author of Duke, A Love Story, published by Athenium. And the picture you're seeing is John Wayne at the Academy Awards two months before his death. And it is a, a it's, oh my, it's a tragic picture. Yeah. Uh, you were there when the heart started to go. It turned out it was a mitral valve. A mitral valve. Yes. And that had broken. Uh, the doctors at uh, Mass General explained to us it's kind of like a little parachute, and it had broken. We had known Duke had had the problem for quite some time, but uh, the fact that he only had one lung from uh, which he had had one removed from cancer in 1964, and they didn't really want to operate unless they had to. Well, later when Duke was in at Mass General, uh, they still weren't sure that they wanted to go through with this operation. So he literally threatened, uh, he said, I want to go through with it, and if you don't, I'm going to jump out this window. He said, however, I do understand what bad publicity it would be for you if John Wayne died in your hospital. Yes. Uh, that um, operation was a total success, and we thought things were on the up from there. Didn't turn out that way. And, and then he has, is diagnosed as having stomach cancer. Right. And it is all through him. Right. He is going through radiation, and I know that can be the tortures of the damned. What you do portray in this book, Pat, is what happens to, whether it's John Wayne or John Doe, the character change, personality change of a man who is dying, that he is not himself because he was a man with humor and intelligence, and suddenly he's the crank. He went through a period, which in, in looking back, I realized, at the time I didn't, but I realized it must be the angry period that I had heard so many ta people talk about. Uh, he couldn't... The denial. Yeah. He couldn't eat. The stomach had been removed, but uh, and he was supposed to be able to eat like six little meals per day. But the cancer was spreading and the blockage was, was happening. And uh, we tried to blame that on the radiation treatments for a while, which wasn't true, of course. And there was a time when he threw a box of grape nuts across the floor and, and said, I won't eat these. The time he threw his tapioca on the floor. And there was the time that he asked me to bring his Smith & Wesson 38 that he wanted to kill himself. Why did you hang around? You'd only known him really three or four years at that point, five. What was in it for you, a young woman, to give so much of your life to this man who was becoming impossible? Well, Connie had almost been seven years, but uh, at that time, in 79, I loved it very much, and uh, I would have stood by him no, no matter how long he had been, he had been sick. There is one scene when you talk about him in the hospital and opening that drawer. Will you talk about that? I had uh, been asked to clear out Duke's room, and uh, we had been told that there were only a few days left. And he was in and out of a coma at that time. And first of all, I had this horror of what if he wakes up and sees me going through and taking out his clothes and getting them out, but that didn't happen. 
But I opened, Connie, the top dresser drawer in his room, and here was something I'd never seen before, nor had I even thought about it. So there was a shroud in plastic and with the directions on what to do after a person died, and I closed that drawer. I'll never forget seeing that there, that here was this man lying there in, in the shroud waiting for him. Yeah. It was something I'll never forget. In the last couple of years when you were going through this, what were the good moments? Oh, a lot of good moments. We still had the times on the Wild Goose, even though uh, Duke was sick a lot, but we would go salmon fishing and, and uh, to Mexico and, and go uh, fishing for marlin, and which we always caught. We were lucky, I guess. So there were the good times, and uh, before he'd gotten sick, there were the trips to, uh, or the trip to Paris, mm -hmm. which Duke had said to me, I'm taking you to Paris if we have to sleep on a park bench, because I hadn't been able to get a reservation to go. So Connie, there were so many good times that uh, um, I wish I could have put all of, all of them in, in Duke a Love Story, but we would have had a War and Peace book, I think. There's also the scene, too, of your going to a couple of the uh, functions. And I'd ask you to talk a little bit about the role of the wife, the woman, the friend, hyphen it, in a Hollywood world where the man is the star. Well, Shirley Fonda told me once, if they're going to finally decide, Pat, if they want the man, they're going to have to accept the woman. And it was never Duke's friends who uh, uh, caused any problems. They were always beautiful to me. It was the people who made the seating arrangements. And one particular case, we were at the Beverly Hilton Hotel, and I may as well have been across town at the Century Plaza Hotel. The man who I had always told Duke was a nice guy, and Duke didn't like him, had always taken up for him. Well, he was doing the seating, and I was supposed to be sitting down front because Duke was up on the dais. Well, I'm in the back of the room. Uh, Duke sends Shirley Fonda to see where what happened to me. But later, we got back to the hotel, and I literally took off this gorgeous dress that Duke mm -hmm. had bought me, threw it down the stairs at him, and said, mm -hmm. I'm not going anymore. Why should you buy me these gorgeous clothes? And they put me in the back of the room. And he said, Pat, that man was your friend, not mine. Uh-huh. He was right. When he would buy you clothes, did he go shopping with you? Yes. He loved to shop. Mm. It's one of his favorite things. How marvelous. So you would go in trying the clothes, and he would say yes or no. It was such fun. And sometimes maybe I'd try on three or four dresses, and he'd say, take all of them. And the reason being that uh, there were so many times when all of a sudden we'd have a kiss, uh, a black tie affair to go mm -hmm. to, and it's not always that easy to find a dress. So he'd say, mm -hmm. take them, they fit, they look great, and then you'll have one the next time you, you need one. But he loved going shopping in, in Mexico. I mean, I practically could have opened a, a blouse shop of Mexican blouses. As soon as we'd get off the wild goose, he says, let's go into town. And he bought things for everybody, Connie, including ordering uh, things out of mail order catalogs. It's interesting how his persona in film is really not the John Wayne you're talking about. One thinks of him as the rigid gun shootist, uh, the really ultra-right, the reactionary, and in some ways he's a far more liberal human person that you've described here. That's right, and Duke also always thought he was liberal as far as politics were concerned. Most people won't agree with that, but uh, he felt that he listened to both sides' uh, opinion and then made up his mind about what he and he was right. What he believed. <laughs> yes. That's right. I mean, he got into more trouble sometimes. There were times when I said, "Duke, why didn't you just keep your mouth shut?" You know, yeah. uh, because he got in on the Panama Canal treaties. And thank God, I missed the. I came to work for Duke right after all the. Uh, Vietnam things that he had gotten involved in. So I, I missed that. Now, you also talk in the book about times that you did have fights. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that a little touchy? I mean, couldn't you get really fired? I mean, you were both, you were in what I would call a rotten situation for a woman. You had nothing legal. 
and you were almost like dependent upon the friendship of friends and his good nature. He did fire me once. Uh, we were working on a picture in Carson City, Nevada. There was gambling downstairs, but uh, Duke didn't feel like going downstairs for dinner, and he had planned to have dinner in his room. I had planned to have dinner with him, along with my friend Peggy Reagan, who was visiting. And uh, so we decided, hey, we're going to get dressed up, nice pantsuits, and uh, because we'd been out on the set all day. So we go in the room, and Duke said, where do you think you're going? We're having dinner in the room. And I said, yeah, I know. So anyway, to make a long story short, he, he insisted that we were planning to go out. So I said, fine, Peggy, let's go. So we went down and, and played blackjack that night uh, till very late. Well, the next morning at 5 o'clock, when I go over to Duke's room, uh, start helping him get his things ready to go out on location, he just started, you know, in and in and on. So finally he said, you're fired. I didn't say a word. He said, uh, but you can, keep, you can keep working for me until you find another job. I thought, what am I going to do? Start dealing at the blackjack table? Yeah. What am I going to do in Carson City? So I went out to the set later that morning. And by then, everybody on the crew had said, Duke, ooh, I wish I could play blackjack like your secretary. So a few minutes after I was there, Duke came over, put his arm around me and said, hey, I hear you won a little money last night. Come on inside the mobile home. It was all over. Uh, we never talked about it again. Pat, we're going to break for one minute, and we will be back with our guest, Pat Stacy, co-author of Duke, A Love Story, published by Athenium. Welcome back. We're talking with Pat Stacy, Duke, A Love Story, published by Athenium. And you're looking at the back cover of this book, and the people in that picture are Pat Stacy and John Wayne. And you must have had at times a funny sort of look. I mean, he was so big, and you are quite petite. So many people said I could fit underneath his arm. Uh, the great thing about Duke, though, was as, as uh, a man, he never made me feel that I was shorter than he. Um, he could have been out with Grace Kelly and not treated her any differently than he treated me in introducing me to, to his friends. It was also not ever, this is Pat, it was always, this is Miss Stacy. Uh, he made you feel that you were as, as tall as he. Pat, you've, you've come out of this okay. He was obviously generous to you in his will. You do mention that you are were left in the will in the book. His children are still your friends. You have now remarried. Right. But if you were to see another young Pat Stacy eight years ago walking into a job with a movie star, maybe not a John Wayne or someone else, what advice would you give her? To be, uh, if it were someone like Duke, to be a perfectionist in what she was doing. Um, but if she got involved in a romance or an affair with him, would you tell her, get out early? What would, you, what would you tell her? Go for it. Why? I spent the most wonderful years of the seven years of my life with John Wayne. Um, I, I said to him once, you gave Mary St. John 28 years. She had worked for him 28 mm -hmm. by the time she retired. And I expect the same, but I didn't get the same, but I... I uh, but did she get the same as you? No. Okay. But I had seven beautiful years. As I mentioned in the book, I had some of the best of times and, 
and some of the worst of times, of course, with Dick being ill. But uh, uh, in the end, he was uh, so courageous and, and kept trying that uh, I was so proud of him and yet wanted to cry every time I saw him walking down that hall. Pat, will you autograph my book for me? Sure. And if you would like a copy of our publication, Good Books, write to me, Connie Martinson, 1627 North Laurel Avenue, Suite 18, Los Angeles, 90046. I'll tell you about another book, also nonfiction, The Hemingway Women by Bernice Kurt. Brilliant book about Ernest Hemingway, who maybe in some ways was a John Wayne character. But uh, this is the book about how he used the women in his lives to become the characters in his books. The women who became Lady Brett Ashley, the woman who becomes across the river and into the trees. Well, these are the women who were in his life. And he almost used each one as new inspiration, new fodder for the writer's imagination. Wonderful book, The Hemingway Women by Bernice Kurt, published by Norton. And if you'd like to read on a smaller scale, Duke, A Love Story by my guest, Pat Stacy. Pat, thank you for joining me. Thank and you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. And we'll see you next week.